So it's in the center. You have it. it can move all over. The, they have crap tons of leaves. So. Yeah. Yeah. We have some Oh. Yeah. So this is the smaller one down here. There's even larger. Oh, okay. So it's all the work Yeah. I like this one. Like there's tons of ones. I like this one. That one. So like it's you don't step down into it. Is that what they're gonna buy? Yeah. Yeah. And then a lot of people have the old um they're going to be special ones. So we have one from the past. So this one from one tree came back to it. Last year's I was in the I mean, even more if you didn't have team, we were just sharing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and on our website, you can click the links to the YouTube channels for each one and it shows it and the dimensions and what the CV is. How that is. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, it wasn't fun to figure it out. I had to go over the Doing that, like, yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. So, I guess if anybody's virtual, can we? Is it audio through the speakers and so on? Uh, I think the last. Oh, you, that's um, out. Um, it doesn't have microphones in the ceiling. No, for the um, sound from the uh, projector. I think yeah, that'll right. come through. Yes, that'll come through the speakers. If so long as you have it set to that Casio PJ. But um, I mean, if you want to test something, so I can we can make sure the volume is all right. So I put the link to the PowerPoint, the uh, Google slides that we're using. Okay. Would you be the right person? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Talk screens. Oh, really okay. Yeah. Um, where should I email those? You want to email? Is that easy? Oh, I thought someone said that was. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Or whatever's easier for you. Yeah, because I have my email. Well, so is, can we have them up as like a live link there, like Google Sheets or Google Slides? Um, because there's gonna be one point where we're gonna ideally be typing in the slides if folks can still read uh -huh. the notes we're having. Thank you so much.
Then we have coffee and and some refreshments just outside the door. Okay. Okay. No, they're right here. Okay. Right outside the door here. And the restrooms, I think, are at the far end of the. Yeah, you're down there. Right. Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, I can hear you. That's fine. Okay. 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 She can hear them. She can hear them. Okay, good. I can actually hear them echo with the phone. Good, good, fantastic. No, I'm fine. My kind of the scariest part. Yeah, like, please let them. Yeah, honestly. Every time I use these, I'm like, every microphone I've used any other location, like the client I have, would not work. <laughs> I'm still not. So, I'm not to make sure our coming. Okay. Just to say you're not. So, you're calling in. Yes. And, um, I mean, let me put it this way. I'm not personally against the state of the union. It's a tugboat. They restarted it. All the yeah, this power strips are pretty gotcha. yeah. <laughs> We learned from last time. <laughs> All right. Where is it? Oh, there. Sean Barkley. Yep. Right here. Yep. How's it going? <laughs> Start the whole meeting over again. Try to enter it from there.
Yeah, it keeps taking me to town hall. Do I need to log into town hall stream? Okay. Yeah, it says, um, it says it's live. Yeah, I mean, I put everything in there exactly like you know. It's still, but um, it's not the test. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, they didn't show up on the test, but it did show up. That's not the right link, though. The meeting. Yeah, the, the um, this is still the testing. Okay. Okay. So we only have one person that's virtual, right? Okay. Great. Yeah, it's a great so the person that's on the virtual, you'll have to send them that link that I sent you. Because the uh, I didn't start the one that begins with 10. This is from the one from the third. It's on the test. So who's doing the virtual? 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just, it's, a, it's like a completely different environment right now. Huge, and um, she just got married. Right, 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 right. Oh, I'm just saying, whoever needs to join virtual will have to use the link that I sent you.
I think it seems like you kind of think we're good. We're good. We're as good as we can be. Yeah. So the one um, woman that was up here, uh, a few Dr. Lawrence. Zach. She has my t- my right. cell phone number. Yeah. She needs me. What we'll call you? You need me for anything. Yeah. Right. Blow me up. You know, okay. call me whatever you need to do. I'll right. run right over. Okay. Appreciate you as always. Um, well, you good luck. To take care. <laughs> I don't see you. Too. I, I just did it this week, so don't give me too much credit. <laughs> um, so, um, Yeah. Well, I have a new clearance on the stage. Now, if you come in, I might be
All right, good morning, everybody. Are we uh, are we live stream? We're live. started through our agenda today, which you all had in advance. So um, how about uh, Mohammed? Can we start with you? But here's the rule of our introduction for this, who are we? Um, a little bit about like what brings us here? Why are we doing this work? Whether you're a board member or a staff member. And um, what, what's your day job? If you're a board member, what is it that you spend the majority of your time doing? So I know from all of you with the AIB and school, and the state board are doing a lot of work in both of those institutions as well. So, Mohammed, did you get to the start? Yep, your name. <laughs> What's your name, job? Is that some easy one, right? Yeah. And what brings you to this work? Uh, my name is Mohammed Kogri. I'm the state superintendent of schools. My name job is to be the state superintendent of schools. <laughs> <laughs> um, seven days a week. Good morning, my name is Rachel Hester. I am the um, elected uh, 
teacher on the Maryland State Board of Education. I was elected by my peers across the state to represent teachers. I am a local music K-5 teacher in the Carroll County Public School System. That's my daytime passion and evening content, and that's going to be too. Um, I, I bring to this work the voice of teachers and what it's like to be in a classroom every day and to try to bring that perspective to policy making because if policies aren't going to work in the classroom, then they're not going to be what they're intended to do. So I bring that perspective. Thank you, Chairman. Um, hey everyone, my um, name is Joseph Mitchell. I uh, my day job is running the education program officer um, at the Able Foundation. Um, but you know, uh, prior to my job at Able for many years, I was an elementary principal. I'm um, like grateful. Um, I feel like you know one of my uh, kind of roles and perspectives is to uh, try to center the, the practitioners that are working with me every day in our school buildings and try to make sure that. Um, the defense works for our kids, but also works for our public work. Thank you. Good morning. I'm uh, Chip Michelle, and I'm a member of the State Board of Education. Uh, I'm a retired attorney. My wife and I are lifelong residents of the Eastern Shore. We live in Salisbury, and I'm here to do whatever I can to help the children there. Thank you. My name is Sean, Sean Bartley. I am a parent of two middle school students that attend William Farquhar Middle School in Montgomery County under the great leadership of Dr. Beidelman, who's the principal there. Um, my um, wife is a teacher of Montgomery County Public Schools, and I am a practicing attorney um, in my own office in downtown Silver Spring. I am a child of public schools, one of the public schools in DOD. Uh, Department of Defense Schools and California Public School System. And I'm matriculated to the University of Maryland. And I don't see Dr. Curran here, but I can see his signature every day on my degree. Uh, I am heavily vested in public education. I received excellent publication of uh, public education, and I'm highly vested in the success of um, students here in Maryland, particularly the African American students. Uh, I know they can succeed because I have. Thank you. And I'm Elliot Schoen, I'm the Attorney General of Legal Counsel to the State Board of Education. Thank you. And I'm Heidi Dutter, our Office of the Attorney General of Legal Counsel to the Accountability and Education Board. Perfect. I'm going to skip you, come back to you. Rachel. Um, good morning. My name is Rachel Amstutz, also known as the other Rachel over at the AIB. <laughs> Um, I am the Operations and Policy Director at the AIB, um, also like Joe and Rachel, uh, hands-on in the school systems, um, also we joke a recovering principal, so 12 years as a principal in um, a variety of types of schools, and what brings me to this work is that after doing it in the field, um, as a teacher and a principal, I, I feel like it's not happening fast enough, the change that we need to see. And so when I was learning about the blueprint, I knew I wanted to be involved. So I would really like to see the change happen and help it happen for all of our students. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Chin Chin Abi uh, Chin, and um, my day job is um, I'm a clinical informatic analyst and um, community division at the Hopkins Hospital. And my passion is here promote um, more interviews and try to get to our students that uh, world class education as much as possible and to be competent and to come <laughs> and that's our ultimate goal. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Emma Pellerin. I am the implementation plan director for the accountability and implementation board. Um, I'm also a former um, educator in Maryland, and um, what brings me to this work is just the unprecedented opportunity for transformational change in Maryland, but also thinking about how other states will be looking to what we're doing here, um, such as that this will create um, potentially a transformational change for students um, across the country, and I think that that's really what drove me to want to be a part of this work. Perfect, thanks. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ramel Green. Um, I am um, on the board here on the State Board of Maryland. I think my passion uh, is what drives me while I'm on the board, and that's to help our Black boys. Um, I have had the privilege of heading the task force on achieving academic equity and excellence for Black boys, and those pilot schools are now implementing uh, those recommendations. In fact, this morning I had the privilege of being at Westlake High School. Uh, one of our pilot schools 
And as I stood there in that room with 25 young black boys, um, just talking about how you know, their, their goals and their achievements and what they wanted to do, my heart just melted. So as I was telling someone earlier, I said, um, uh, like Dr. Martin Luther King, I was not equating myself to him at all, but he said, uh, I've been to the mountaintop. I may not get to the, get there with you, but at least it started. So long after I'm gone, I hope that people in this room keep it going for our black boys. They're at the bottom of test scores and at the top of suspension, expulsion and arrest rates. And I think transformation as um, uh, Mr. Chodry has said, transformation can succeed if we're leaving our, our most vulnerable behind. So I hope that the members of the AIB and the school board, that you keep it going. Right now, they're existing on a grant that is supposed to run out in, in another year. But I hope, because this isn't just a three-year plan. This is a long-term plan. And it's not going to succeed without the support of the people in this room. So I pray that you keep it going, because if our Black boys are in trouble, so will we all. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mary Thomas. I'm just a student member of the State Board of Education. Um, my passion to being here is to bring the student voice. I'm very active for that. And today, I'm going to be in the office and to the students that are going to be in the classroom. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, folks. I'm Laura Stapleton. I'm a member of the Accountability and Implementation Board. My day job is as a uh, uh, fabulous experience as department chair at the University of Maryland I'm a professor of measurement statistics and evaluation. And what brings me to this is um, I was part of the team that, that uh, scaled up the Maryland longitudinal data system. I um, am passionate about data use and I study evaluation and uh, methodology. And so what better context to apply um, evaluation and then research education. So one, thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Holly Wilcox. I'm a professor at Johns Hopkins Greenberg School of Public Health in School of Medicine and School of Education. I um, teach undergraduate and graduate students in public health. I'm a medical professional, and so I focus on suicide prevention in my day job, um, on some national projects and local projects. I joined the school board. Um, Right after the pandemic started, when it was really clear that the mental health impacts of the pandemic on the students' health were, were quite substantial. And that was before the Surgeon General um, declared a national children's mental health emergency. So I, I come to this position really wanting to think about policy solutions for, that will enhance students' wellness, as well as uh, prevent different types of mental health outcomes and how that can be done as part of a coordinated plan for the state. Thank you. Thank you. Warner Sumter, retired military and public safety. Uh, education background is a grandfather, aunts, a father, and a daughter that were teachers on the generation that skipped. Uh, <laughs> But I was on the local board of education in uh, my county and president of May. And I'm so excited to be on the state board at the time when we are given an opportunity to do some really great things for the students of the Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Lisa Fox, and I am the president of the accountability and education board. I am a lifelong educator. I um, just retired. Um, not too long ago, uh, started in 30 years as a college administrator. And what brings me here is my work and my passion, my love, and my life of making sure that students um, are coming from college to career, whether that be in your enrollment, from middle college, senior degrees, uh, very innovative pathways, whatever that is, to prepare them for college. And um, I am a public school advocate. I'm a public school, and my children have been integrated just as a public school and now they have successful careers because of that. And so all of this is put together, and I am so happy and very excited to be here. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. 
Um, my name is Lori Morrow. I am the designated parent member of the State Board of Education. Um, so my last full-time day job was an intel officer in the United States Air Force. But for the last 19 years, really my day job has been um, to be a mom. I currently have two teenagers, uh, one who graduated in 2021, and then a daughter who's for the county public schools as a freshman this year. Um, and with that, I have served on various advisory councils, worked as a community organizer, public school advocate, PTA president, middle school PTO president, all of those things, which is how I ended up um, in this position. And my passion really has been that community engagement, family engagement, um, making sure that, that the community sees what, what we're doing here as well. Um, and is able to participate that they have that ownership in, in their school system. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, Zach Hands, I'm the executive director for the State Board of Education. Uh, it's my second stint with the state's education system and uh, day three on this job for me here. So I'm really thrilled to be here with both boards um, to work on the implementation of the blueprint. Um, I'm particularly passionate about you know, successful outcomes for all of our students. So it's a privilege to be here today. And, uh, Thank you. Um, I am former state senator Gail Bates. I'm former management. Um, <laughs> there's a message there. Um, anyway, uh, mother of two, grandmother of three. I taught in the public schools prior to having my children. I taught both um, middle school at that time, it was junior high, math, and then uh, home economics. And I still love working with. Uh, young people, the people young, but mind it, how old you are. <laughs> and anyway, uh, this past Saturday, I had 10 young ladies making Christmas cookies at our church kitchen, and uh, we've never seen something else, but it was really fun. So I still love working with kids. I've been on the board four years now, and uh, I did a good job. Thank you. Thank you. All right, can I get Chair of the uh, new board. I heard everything else Brad said, so I agree with everything I've heard so far. <laughs> Hi, Clarence Crawford, President of the State Board. This is personal uh, for me, and you see my bio on the right, but when I graduated high school in DC, I couldn't read. If you had seen me then, you would have said, boy, you probably not going to make it. I had dyslexia. I remember what it was like being in class or even in Sunday school when <laughs> teachers and others would criticize and laugh at me because I couldn't read. When I started college at 22, uh, my mother had to read them. Well, I subsequently learned to read and very blessed. Um, had great people come into my life. So I remember, I remember those days. And so for me, this opportunity to do something for the children in the state of Maryland is very personal to me. We have an opportunity to to do something that would dramatically change the outcomes and and the lives of um, generations of children. And I'm just excited to be in this group with individuals who are committed to doing what's necessary to change the outcomes and the performance, the education performance of our children. Thank you. <laughs> I, uh, my name is uh, Rick Kerwin. I'm Chancellor Emeritus of the University uh, System of Maryland. And uh, I was chair of the Commission on Innovation and Excellence in, in, in Education, which of course uh, led to the, uh, the, the Blueprint Bill. Um, I am here because I've invested the last six years of my life almost daily in the result of the development of the blueprint is so we can hear deeply about it. And I'm thrilled to be working with all of you and uh, 
changing what we hope will be transformative for the state of Maryland. I apologize for being a little late today, but the Board of Regents of the University System of Maryland is very interested in the new plan, and they asked me to come and talk about the implications for higher education. So I've been lost uh, uh, on my way here, and I think we'll try to be able to Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Getty, and I'm a member of the state board, and I do not have a state job. I'm uh, happy to retire. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, good, good to be here. Thank you very much. Well, there's definitely some commonality here among stuff, right? I heard us all talk about the service to students and communities and families, and so. Um, that is definitely the that I see amongst all of us. So Paul's going to give us a little landscape of what our plan is today, and then we're going to dig in. Dig in. My name is Paul Pastorex. Uh, I've been a practicing lawyer for a long time, but presently running an online university for the University of Arizona. Uh, but my experience is relevant to this is I served on the State Board of Education in Louisiana for eight years back in the late 90s and early 2000s. Yes, I'm that old. Uh, and I also uh, uh, served as a state superintendent uh, for Louisiana after Hurricane Katrina. Uh, that just gives me a little perspective. I don't plan to offer much of that, but I hope that with my knowledge, I'm able to help coax out of you the kinds of things that I think you want to try to express today. I, I would say that there are really two basic objectives that we have today. One is to uh, solidify our common vision for the future of education in Maryland. Uh, you all have very specific experiences, as you've described, and very specific reasons why you're here. Uh, as a board of education, you have a common objective, and as the AIB, you also have a common objective. When you look at your mission, they're quite similar. The question is, how do we deepen the understanding and the pursuit of the common objectives for the state of Maryland? And talking about this today, it's believed that with this joint meeting, you'll have that opportunity. So that's point one. How do we solidify the common agenda that each board has? The second is to look at the blueprint, to learn a bit more about the blueprint. Many of you know it, but we're going to give you a common presentation, uh, one that hopefully will explain the pillars of the blueprint and the 10 year objectives that are set forth. Then we will move into uh, another segment where you will be invited to brainstorm what you think the interim objectives should look like. So the blueprint has a long term objective and goals. But what does that look like in the midterm? What does that look like in three to five years? It's a blue, it's a uh, it's an opportunity to brainstorm. It's not intended to be decision making, it's intended to share once again your ideas and to begin to develop a common understanding of what these midterm goals might look like. Any questions? All right, to the next, uh, the first big agenda item here. Go ahead, Lee. Yeah, so we're going to start with, um, as you guys, I know all of you know that we had a small subgroup of both the boards uh, come together in November. <clears throat> and that subgroup, we had some nice, great discussion, and we, but we grounded in the target, the target of success for both of the organizations. So, the, the vision uh, for the Maryland State Department of Education is we will be a system of world-class schools where students acquire the knowledge and skills necessary for success in college, career, and life. The AIB's uh, vision is 
And all Maryland students, regardless of where they live, household income, race, ethnicity, gender, language, spoken at home, disability, and any other unique characteristic, leave high school globally competitive and prepared for success in post-secondary education, work, and life. When we took a look at this as a collective, we saw there was a lot of commonality. That the target of success was very much shared between the two boards. And I think it's important as we kind of dive into this discussion today is that our goal is collectively is that we're shooting arrows, we're putting our attention and our energy towards achieving both of these visions, which are very similar to me. Okay, so we're just grounding in that. So now I'm going to ask the chairs to kind of give us a, a, a recap a little bit and some understanding of kind of some of those core things that we're going to center around as we begin to do this work today. So I'm going to start with the chairs tonight. First of all, uh, someone asked me why would I take on this responsibility? And initially, I laughed about that. And after five months, uh, the last turned into something else. Because I realized the challenge began to look like we had. But I also realized the opportunity we had to do the job and do the same thing. Let me say something so that you can fully understand what I said it before. And people may have been a little confused that I said that it's head of the AIT. Had I created this system that we now have, my initial thought in terms of leadership number one, organization number one, I probably would not have created an AIP. The initial reaction probably reacted to what the management the responsibility that the general assembly provided for the AIP. I would rest it in the hands of the existing state leaders. But for whatever reason, separate. The General Assembly decided that they would not do that. And therefore, created a separate board with a great deal of responsibility in the past, but I think in many ways overlap. Now, having recognized that that was not a good way I would put it, this is what the General Assembly decided to do. And I see my responsibility now. I'm elected as the chair to execute. Therefore, the emphasis for us is how do we enhance the accountability? How do we enhance implementation? Very simple, very straightforward. The word says AIP is accountability and implementation. And so, where we are now is the area of making the first full step toward implementation on a very comprehensive plan. And it is incumbent upon us to work together. There will be some difficulties, there will be some challenges, but I'm optimistic that we can work through it. and I had an opportunity to work together. We met on a number of occasions. Uh, as indicated earlier, we share the same vision, the same growth. And the challenges that he called the run up in the young guy. And so bringing us together today. Hopefully, we provide us with an opportunity first to better understand each other, to recognize the shared vision that we see, and to make certain that we implement it with high Implement it with high And if we can do that, at the end of the day, uh, we've done a great job at the state and the children. Of the state. I am convinced, yeah, I'm optimistic. We started with something that Law and this comprehensive uh, that naturally will be some challenges. There will be challenges, but those challenges are not insurmountable. And so we have spent a great deal of time together talking about this. We had a prior meeting, and so we ran out some of the things that we want to accomplish. And clearly, we want to be collaborative, we want to be a partner. Because at the end of the day, if you're a student, so today, let's look at partnership collaboration as a focal point for how we achieve our goals. That's the task 
That's why we are here. That's why we are here. And I think that we have an opportunity to ensure in your success. Thank you. First thing I want to do is just uh, acknowledge the fine work of um, the Kerwin Commission. Most of the time, these commissions get harder. The most you get out of them is a, um, a nice report that says on the shelf, nothing else. But I want to just compliment the Kerwin Commission and all everyone who supported it in that in this instance, we have legislation, even more than just legislation. We have a commitment on behalf of the state of Maryland to invest in the states not have. 
and that experience in a state that was probably one of the poorest in the nation. The kids had some of the most difficult backgrounds and circumstances. They had significantly improved their reading skills, and I was in some of the That comment, in addition to everything else in the family, that comment rested with me for a long period of time. How could we be in that type of situation where we're looking at people and communities or comparing our median performance to those of the state of the That's all interesting. But this should not be what we're facing here in the great state of Illinois. And maybe the county that was many years in Montgomery County, uh, I was lulled into belief based on our performance mostly that our community, our state was doing far better than it actually is. But when you look deeply into the current condition, when you hear comments like that, uh, it suggests we have a long way to go for all of our students. And so there is a sense of urgency to me. Uh, that we have to improve this and we can do so quickly. We didn't like Michigan City. Keep that point in mind. It's unacceptable in this state. Thank you, uh, gentlemen. Uh, we have a couple of minutes. Would anyone on either of the boards like to make a very brief comment about this subject? I'd just like, I, I believe we have a board member who is virtually with us. Could we have her introduce herself? I did ask her. Oh, she said she thought the moment had passed, but um, I okay, dragged the moment back. Yes, yeah, so that's <laughs> fine. <laughs> Hi. Um, can she hear us? I can, I can hear. Yeah, are you, are you talking, first of all, are you talking about me? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, that's so much. Okay. Um, all right. So we're going to uh, do a quick. I can hear Jennifer. Can you hear Jennifer of, or, of or me? the comprehensive plan? And so we have some slides um, that we're that Rachel and Mohammed are going to kind of tag team a little bit and just giving a very high level, uh, quick overview. And then we're going to dig into uh, the next part. This this arrow here. One, oh, one, oh. Oh, here, if, if you need the copy, if you, it's on the website, if you want to pull it up, if you want to grab this QR code to pull it up to see the full plan, but we're going to go through um, some, uh, some of the different sections. So Rachel, want to get us started? Sure. So um, the um, five pillars of the blueprint for our own future uh, are sort of this graphic that we've been using to just sort of very simply show the five pillars, um, but we do have separate slides for each pillar that we want to walk through. But um, overall, the five pillars are designed to support the overall sort of goal of the blueprint, which is really embedded in the vision of both NSPD and AIP, which is to prepare our kids uh, to be uh, globally competitive and, and ready for success in, in work and college and life. Um, and so that's sort of the high church is sort of holding up the foundation of the, of the goal. Um, if you can go to the next slide, we have about pillar one. Uh, so pillar one is focused on early childhood education. And the key policy elements there are um, expanding full day pre-K for uh, all four-year-olds. And low income three year olds in a mixed delivery system, meeting with, meeting with public and private providers, and also um, on the sliding scale where low income three and four year olds can connect for free. I don't know. Um, and as part of that, we also might increase the quality of early childhood education 
uh, providers and uh, staff and expand support to young children and their families through the uh, duty centers and uh, the family support centers or, or county centers. And then for fully fund the uh, Maryland Infant Fathers Program um, for, for kids who need additional supports early in life. And you know, ultimately improve student readiness for kindergarten with the overall expected outcome from pillar one being uh, on the right hand side, being that all students enter kindergarten ready to learn. Um, that's, that's the ultimate goal of pillar one. And that includes being developmentally ready, including physical, social, and emotional. Thanks. Mohammed, any, any additional context you want to add to pillar one? All right. I want to answer any questions first on pillar one before we go to pillar two. Any general questions that we have, curiosity that we have? Actually, I have one, Rachel. Mm -hmm. On pillar one, when you say this is the objective, is that the 10 year objective? Yes. Okay. Yes. Or full outcome. Yeah. Which might not even be in 10 years. Yes. All right. Let's go to pillar two. Oh, question. <laughs> questions. Okay, we're going to go to pillar two. Okay, so pillar two is a lot. Uh, pillar two encompasses um, high quality and diverse teachers and school leaders. Um, and so that includes increasing the, um, the rigor of our teacher preparation programs and our education licensure programs. Um, increasing educator compensation and improving working conditions so that more, uh, more folks are attracted to teaching as a profession, um, instituting new recruitment and professional development efforts to create a more diverse workforce. Uh, we want to make sure that our, our workforce um, looks like the students that they're teaching. Um, Establishing a new uh, a statewide career ladder for teachers to um, improve professional practice and student performance. And that includes um, in more time during the school day for teachers to be collaborating with their peers, working uh, with students, and not just constantly in front of the classroom instructing. And, um, and then a more comprehensive um, in, in service induction program for new teachers because we know that we lose, um, I think, about 50% of our teachers in the first three to five years um, and, uh, and enhanced professional development that's embedded in the, in the work day. And those policies are intended to achieve the expected outcome, which is that Maryland has a high quality teacher and leader workforce that approximates the diversity of Maryland students statewide and by district is sufficient to fill all needed positions and roles in schools and districts across the state and provide 
provide professional learning opportunities for through student outcomes um, and additional responsibility of learning status and compensation as they gain expertise. All right. That's a lot. <laughs> Any questions around pillar two? Yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, questions. Teachers and educators to our Maryland State. 
So it's always some um, options outside the box to create the reward for us. That's another way of looking in the other Okay, we're gonna we're gonna have lots of time to input on what we get success looks like. So we're just trying to clarify pillar two right here. Um, the first bullet point in pillar two was increase the rigor for licensure of teachers. And that is a clear concern to me because right now, I think in some school districts, we have a shortage of teachers. Um, and will increasing the rigor for licensure of teachers help meet the, de the demand because of the shortage of teachers? Um, and so I think that's really important to address. If we increase the rigor, Teachers, are we going to be able to meet the demand for teachers? Perfect. Okay, we're going to shift and look at pillar three. It's not, it's not even All right, Rachel. Oh, yeah. Okay, so pillar three is college and career readiness, and um, there's a lot in this pillar as well. Um, it, uh, it's been referred to as the North Star of the Blue Care Cycle Board. Um, and so the first policy is to implement a pre K through 12 curriculum uh, that uh, provides for students to be college and career ready. Um, by the end of 10th grade, and no later than 12th grade. And to help uh, align instructional system uh, with resources and supports that makes, helps to keep students on track um, during their uh, from pre K uh, uh, to becoming CCR. Um, again, by the end of 10th grade and no later than 12th grade. Uh, to provide students with the resources necessary to achieve reading proficiency by the end of grade three, because we you know that's a critical. Um, gateway to success uh, to create a statewide framework for rigorous career and technical education programs uh, and skill standards and then to establish pathways for college and career readiness, college and career readiness, and non-college and career readiness students, the grades 11 and 12. So for those students who are, who are ready by the end of 10th grade, uh, for college and career readiness, they would move on to uh, post CCR pathway. And students who aren't ready yet, there would be additional supports um, and, and work different, different approaches to help students uh, achieve the college and career readiness standard before they leave high school. And so those things, uh, those policies are intended to support the expected outcomes which are that um, Maryland has an empirically based college career readiness standard that reflects readiness for post-secondary education uh, and training programs. And uh, Maryland has an education system designed to ensure that all students who enter school ready to learn can reach the standard by 10th grade and no later than 12th grade and move on to a choice of high quality post college and career readiness programs that prepare students for college, offer college credit in high school, potentially even earning an associate's degree before they leave high school, and provide high quality CTE training, uh, including apprenticeship opportunities. Question. Thank you. The, uh... One of the challenges I think I got a few years of answer from Superintendent Charlie is sometimes earlier. The boy is the perception that we are tracking certain categories. That perception continues to exist, and we need to address that in our flag. Charlie did not share. How we can hopefully avoid that problem because that's where we're real headed in the challenge. Questions? There's a question here. Oh, you're wanting to ask? Yeah, I'm 
How do we avoid the challenge of parents and other believing in the attractive student on the career side, which obviously would be a challenge in my opinion for what's going forward? Fully into it. But we can start by tracking to begin with. Maryland does have a culture of tracking. When you go into um, the pathways in Montgomery County and you're going to go apply for ID, you got to have a lead academic to get in. You go and look at the application for Bar Early College, you got to have grades. That is not true in Massachusetts, that is not true in other places, that is not true in so we need to start that first. We need to set up funding programs that incentivize tracking. We need to start funding, set up funding programs that support that kind of behavior. So we have an opportunity with the implementation to basically put that pressure on the school system in a healthy way, in a supportive way, and take that both together. It's a role of support guided. Um, I always talk to my students about that. All three have to be true every day. And so we need to start with that. Uh, we do have a lot of tracking. We do. Um, and, you know, and we do need to use this moment with this country. Right? When we get all kids get access to pathways and they come up with a plan on how kids get into ID, how kids get into an apprenticeship, how kids get into all those things, we need to make sure we have a proving plan and a funding plan and a supporting plan. That do that. And so that's very important. Uh, that we have this golden moment now to do this, right? We have this golden moment now with unprecedented funding. People are be working at this time. And that's fine. That's what we do have. That's it. it may have been a cultural thing or not, because everyone's having a recognition, right? The country's having a recognition. You know, the number one school on the US World Union in Virginia, uh, is our science. Right. They had a record, yes. They had a record. Um, uh, the Boston, uh, the Boston school, right? That's uh, very famous for it. Uh, New York is having a record. So we have this golden opportunity to do this. I mean, it is a very important pathway that every system I went to, I was a part of the contracting. And so we have this golden opportunity. And apprenticeship and CTE are as equal as going to college. And I think that's very important. So we are going to offer I just put out a major grant to Biden Challenge with a state set aside for dollars for school systems. I'm going to make it very highly competitive. I'm going to give them dollars back to supercharge that quest to 45 percent and exclusively focus on registration. And it is that we said that it is for all kids, the high achieving kids, the low achieving kids, and everything in between. So that's what we'll do. We'll for now. <laughs> All right, other questions on pillar three. Um, how do we ensure that students um, in poverty students in low income can how are we partnering with higher ed to get them some of these college credits you know, without having the financial expense? Um, I know some some locals have it expense for each other, some do not. And so how do we make sure that all students have access to early college credits without having the expense of that? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I was thinking about some other things. Yeah, I think we're going to get to that. Yeah. Yeah. My question. Yeah. 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 Question. All right. Any other clarifying questions on pillar three? Five minutes. Yes, let's shift them. Pillar four. Can you uh, advance the slide to pillar four? Right. <clears throat> okay. So pillar, pillar four is uh, more resources for students to be successful. So this is, yeah, it's not just about funding equity, but that's a big part of it. <coughs> so making sure that we provide more support for students in schools that need it most, specifically English language learners. Students from low income households and students receiving special education services. Um, there's a new concentration of poverty grant program that is providing resources directly to the schools 
uh, to support the community school model and enhance wraparound services for all students in their schools. And uh, there is a new support to meet students in their home needs um, in, in the community uh, and bring them into the schools and provide technical assistance to the school system. And um, again, these policies are intended to support the expected outcomes, which is that um, all those students who I talked to talked about um, receive the additional resources and services they need to be successful um, in school and their overall health and well being, so that they meet the college and career readiness standard at the same rate as all other students. <coughs> Um, and to make sure that students uh, who need behavioral health services can access them. So again, a lot and, and a heavy lift, but I think some of the most uh, important work uh, for the movement implementation. Okay, questions. Questions on pillar four, any clarity that you need on pillar four. <clears throat> yep. When Checker, is it Checker? That was his nickname. Was that the board? Um, he presented the blueprint to the state board. And I remember when he did that. And he could probably tell you that I counsel on him because I said, when I read to this part, I said, I see English language learners mentioned. Low income houses, possible students receiving special ed. And, and then I said, wait a minute, provide more support for students who need it most. And again, if you talk to Jamel Green for more than 50 seconds, I'm going to talk about my black boys. Who needs it more than our black boys that for decades are at the very bottom? How can we continue to ignore and not give them what they need? I just, I just thank um, uh, Mr. Choji's predecessor, uh, uh, Dr. Sandler, who got tired of hearing me talk about it, <laughs> and who allocated at that time what I thought was a tremendous amount of money, $3 million to help our Black boys. But when I think of the millions and millions of dollars the AIB has, not necessarily, I shouldn't say at its disposal, but at it, in its resource bucket to, to have some of my schools, some of our private schools who are piloting the recommendations they have on that voice to really be fearful that their funding is going away. Yes, Mr. Chosen, you have committed, and I thank you for that, but I really think it needs to be written somewhere that in that list of students who needed more, there's no group of students, and there's a lot of them, thousands and thousands of students who have for decades been at the bottom. And that's our Black list. Thank you. Okay, other questions on Pillar 4? In 1994, when I graduated from the University of Maryland, Dr. Kerwin in his speech said that the University of Maryland graduated more African American students than any other predominantly white university at the time to attract ever success. And I remember that, Dr. Kerwin. And when I look at pillar four, and that is not a priority um, for the schools, and echoing what Dr. Vermel Green said, is that the people that are at the bottom of the heap. Are African American students. I looked at some statistics from Montgomery County Public Schools, and it was interesting that children of immigrant parents who had no English speakers in the home were outperforming African American students that are fully invested in this country, foundational Black Americans that have one allegiance to this country, and they're being outperformed by everyone else. And when you look at this, the priority for Maryland is not the lowest performing students. And I would hope 
that institutions like the University of Maryland and our public education system here in Maryland would continue to focus on African American students. Thank you. Okay, we're going to. I just need to add something. Um, so it's important to understand that, you know, because of the legacy of this investment in our community, the legacy of, of folks, you know, segregated, but still segregated as well, the funding that is there dedicated to the constitution of public school, the funding of per pupil weight of all the students, that is directed exactly at communities where disproportionately they serve less schools. So it's important to remember that. Yes, it is not explicit. We can talk more about those issues. And after a green note, I also told her like the schools have to perform though. They have to perform. So we are doing a reverse program evaluation. I said, I told her, once we do the program evaluation, I will be able to have to all the national things that make this permanent, right? So the schools have to perform. However, the resources, the one thing about Kerwin, you know, and, and one of the big reasons why I came here is they studied adequately. Now we can debate whether we're fully adequate. I think we can do better. That was the major of the poverty presentation, but we can talk about that later. But in terms of the level of per pupil funding that if you are a poor child in the room, the <coughs> level of funding if you are a student with special needs, level of funding if you are an English learner, it is unprecedented. It can't happen fast enough over the 10 year period. It's going to be plus the base funding, right? So those. Because of the intersectionality of the injustices of the past and where we are still, and reckoning with backwards housing policy and everything else, disproportionately that funding is going to be You're not going to do all that. Make sure that you pour enough money to try to fund that. So I will argue that no other state has looked at funding like that. Now it's dead it's about education. And in the plan, we are putting, you have to disaggregate your data by gender, by, by a specific subgroup, and you have to make projections about moving the needle. So I just want you to have that as very clear. And then do some too much. Right? That's very important. All right, we're going to shift and look at pillar five. Can you advance the slide here to pillar five? The last one. Yep. There you go. Right, and just piggybacking on what the superintendent just said, I'm going to sort of go backwards here and look at the expected outcome of Pillar 5, which is really, again, the overall goal of the movement for Maryland's future, which is um, that all students, regardless of where they live, household income, race, ethnicity, gender, disability, language spoken at home, any other unique characteristics, all Maryland students leave high school globally competitive and secured for success in college, career, and life. And that is absolutely, absolutely of the um, And the policies that are intended to help get there included the creation of the AIB to oversee and monitor implementation of the blueprint and uh, and accountability for implementing the blueprint with fidelity. Um, the state and local blueprint implementation plan, the superintendent has referred to the LEA template a number of times, and that's what the school systems will be submitting with their blueprint plan. Um, the new expert review teams with NSCE and the CTE committee, and that's where we're going to be um, visiting schools and making recommendations to improve student achievement. And, and then this last one, which I think is um, overlooked, um, requiring school systems to show that at least 75% of their per pupil funding through, uh, across the various funding formulas are following students in their school. This is something that has not been done. Um, the money goes to the school systems and they allocate the funding. And it's not. It's not through the lens of the, making sure that the resources that are being provided for certain students are making their way down to that school. So I think this is one of the um, game changers um, in the blueprint um, because we really, you know, we're, we're providing funding at the state level, the state and local level, to support these levels of resources that 
the program commission and adequacy study said this is what you need to be sending for these students to be successful. And um, the dollars are always making their way to the school and to the students that do it. And um, so hopefully this will provide um, a little more accountability and make sure if the resources are getting are, it's not just about money though, right? It's about what they're doing. Okay, so there are five questions. Things we're curious about, wondering about. Okay, so this is why this conversation of this joint board is important. It's important that we hear concerns, that we kind of hear where our curiosity lands that will help inform then the discussions of the future. Today is not about resolving these things at this point. Today is about figuring it out. And then the next thing we're gonna do is start to dream a little bit from your perspective of what we hope to see achieved, as, as, as Paul mentioned, in the next interim of three to five years. Okay, so to prepare you for that work that you're, we're gonna, we're gonna dig into your brain power here in a few minutes. To, to prepare you for that, we are going to feed you. And then we're also going to figure out this audience issue. So um, we have lunch right out here, a, a grab lunch, right? Yep, then we'll kick in with your working lunch. Right, we're going to grab lunch, we're going to come back in here, and we're going to have a working, we're going to keep and work as we move the next bit. All right? So we're going to take, let's take, uh, let's take a good 10 minutes to use the restroom, grab lunch, come back in here, and then we'll get started again in about 10 minutes. Fair? So that takes us to 11, basically 11.30. Okay, 11.30. That's 50 minutes. All right, thank you. It works. Yeah. I was able to hear it better. Better. It's not super loud. I'm going to see if we can the audio. Yeah, so can we get audio from the speakers to go out to the show? Yeah. Like a Seinfeld episode. I think it setting. I think that's what we did. Right? Yeah, I said, who's your outside voice? You want yeah, the speakers to also go to the Zoom room? Yeah. Yes. Not not use um not use that mic anymore, but just use the this microphone as the main audio. So that goes out to the but not not this microphone, but the speakers. Or do you mean a handheld microphone? The handheld microphone that we were using, the, the audio was coming from these speakers. This isn't so broadcasting. Yeah, we can't stop the stream. So where's the where's the microphone you guys are trying to use? Yeah. Yep. Because you don't, you're not getting input yeah. from the system. You're out there. And these are also <laughs> out there. So I don't, I don't have a way to input from this to that. Wait, listen. You'd say, you'd say great state, and then you'd say Gary and me. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> well, um, so I'll, 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 I'll double check with Patrick just to make sure that it's like, yeah. <laughs> like literally, even with the mic. Because it's just, even though it's louder in the room. Yeah. Yeah. Still yeah. Still yeah. I mean, oh yeah, I can imagine if you're speaking through this, yeah. it's probably like it's like thinking the noise cancel. Like without that, we couldn't hear well, mm -hmm. but with it we can hear them, but it's just it really depends on the audience. All right, so they did it different kind of situation. 
no, no, no. This is for the Because basically they're, they're changing the login process. You don't have to do anything right now. Oh, okay. Um, and so all the yeah. way they transit to the login process. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So since I have it all set is, up, you know, it's fine. Okay. It's you good. Yeah. 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 Thank the Monday one is it played through the meeting, which is Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. So that way it's just audio from the mic is just going straight in the room, but not out to the apparently it was work like it didn't work when Brit the first person spoke, but then it did work over yeah, here because right. they said they could hear. Yeah. But I think it's going in and I'm out. listening to it now. So when you were talking, I knew you just heard. Oh okay. Um, and they were talking so to certain people. Yeah. I couldn't hear it. So I couldn't hear him. Okay. So I don't know. Yeah, I I, I don't have a way to yeah. work out. Okay. So you're listening right now? Yeah. What, can you hear things? It's totally getting it. like real. Yeah, it's not. Is this is an on? Okay, no. good. <laughs> Let's keep it that way until please. we come back yes. together, please. I was saying, I don't really think. I believe that if the noise cancellation wasn't going to light the speaker. Turn this up. This mic is up just a little bit more. Yeah, I was gonna say that's pretty sizable. I can see you over there still. Thank <laughs> you. 
Paul, we, we do have a slide show showing that slide that's all right. When do those uh, get? Um, uh, let's run a few more checks. All right, I'm giving a two-minute warning. Please tell your colleagues outside. Two-minute warning. Do it, do it outside. Let me know when you're about ready. Um, give people a 30 second warning. I'm going to go back to the top of the I left it all. So you just hold. I'm sure you saw it. You never know. And if you want to turn up anymore, just do this. Okay. We're good with this, Paul. Put the PowerPoint back up. Yep, PowerPoint back up. Perfect. It's live. Next, um, just the next slide. Okay. Our microphone is a little louder now. There you go. Can everybody hear me? What about people online? If you can chat online and let us know whether you're hearing better, uh, that would be appreciated. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's get started with the next session. This is probably the most important section. Session. I thought the last session was excellent. Gives everybody an opportunity to speak to each other on the board about your perspectives on these pillars. 
Um, but this is now an opportunity to talk about where, what, what does success look like in three to five years? So to refresh your memory, the pillars describe what success looks like in 10 years. That is what they describe success, what the outcome should be in 10 years. But we're going to talk about an intermediate point. You have to, uh, you're welcome to talk about the 10-year goal. And if you have comments and thoughts about the 10 years old. But the prime objective is to begin to offer information around the middle term. Where do we go from three to five years? Now, let me give you some context for this. There will be official work groups. There's a slide here. There will be official work groups that will be formed soon. I understand they will include an invitation to uh, people to apply to serve on a work group. Is that correct, Rachel? Yes. Uh, on Andy's website, there is a there is a link to. Oh. Yes, on the AIB's website, there's a link uh, on the on the front website to a, a form to fill out if you want to either nominate yourself or nominate someone else. Perfect. What a wonderful way to get the public involved. Um, these work groups will be formed soon, and there will be specific representation uh, for the work groups. Uh, and these work groups will be working on the idea of where the interim and intermediate uh, outcomes should, should begin to show up and what they should look like and what their goals should be. But today, this is a, an early opportunity for members of the AIB and the board to discuss this very subject, so you, in effect, get an opportunity to say what your thoughts are about these intermediate goals. All right, so I'm gonna turn this back over to Lisa and she will facilitate this. Lisa? Yep. All right. Lisa, I have just one comment. Okay. One of the comments we have heard as we've gone around and talked to different boards and, and uh, the gallery walks is people say to us whether they are administrators or members of local boards, I've never seen this day. I did not know what, I didn't understand what the reading levels were. I didn't know about the turnover. I didn't know these things. So to me, one of the goals in the next three to five years is when I looked at our website, I looked at websites of some of the other uh, LEAs, it seems to me one of the things we should have prominently on the front page of every website essentially is how am I doing? Data on that particular LEA with respect to the, the goal. So that when you as a parent, as a taxpayer, um, as an administrator, when you go to a website, come to our website, go to the AIB website, go to Anne Arundel, Montgomery, Worcester. The first thing you see is how we're doing. Right, that would be one of the major measures of success for me. In, in, the, in the overall transparency. Yeah. In three or five years, be that level of transparency. Yeah. Thank that you. Would be Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so what we're going to do, can you, oh, there. Um, we're going to advance the slide. So we're going to go back to pillar one, all right? And we're going to spend a little time dreaming. The goal of this time together is not to get to consensus. We're not, we're not trying to all agree that this is where we think we have to be or should be. All we're trying to do is dream a little bit. If we were to execute on pillar one extremely well, what would change? 
what would happen as we shoot for that expected outcome 10 years or further, all right? But in, in my mind, this is a relatively easy to document progress. <clears throat> we, we're investing in these preschools, uh, high quality preschools, and uh, the, the objective is for kids to make, make it to kindergarten ready to learn. So we have an AR, a ARA kindergarten readiness assessment. So we ought to have some metrics. I mean, the goal is to have all kids ready to learn when the fit movement is fully implemented. But we ought to be able to show some progression uh, over the next three or four years and still start to come from preschool into, uh, in, into kindergarten and show a steady progression on the ARA uh, uh, metric. So I heard more kids and progression of, okay. All right. Pillar one. We're going to take some notes. Patrick's notes. Do I need to advance the slide, please? We're going to take some notes. Pillar one. What else would you expect to see as we implement pillar one? What would you hope to see? I would expect that as students are coming out of high quality preschool and ready to learn in kindergarten, that in three to five years, we would start to see a change in the data for our third grade reading and math because they will have been able to acquire those skills, give us two or three years to come in with the skill, we build on it in first and second grade, and by the time they're in third grade, we should see that they are now reading to learn, I mean, no longer learning to read, but reading to learn. So that's where I see it in the long term. I'm going to go here, I'm not coming over there. All right, so I agree um, absolutely with um, Brett and Rachel just on um, the key metrics being achievement in the KRA and then ultimately um, proficiency in third grade reading assessments in particular. Um, I think there's also just some kind of absolute, absolute numerical um, values we should be looking at. The number of um, four year olds across the state. And ensuring that a, a large majority of them are enrolled in um, in pre kindergarten um, in pre kindergarten experiences, and then similarly, um, just a tabulation of how many three year olds we have um, across the state, and um, as time goes on, an increase in the amount of um, three year olds that are participating in um, in uh, public supported and uh, private supported three year old programming. Um, and then also keeping track of the number of students that the percentage of students that are being supported by private providers versus um, public schools um, and making sure that we're hitting those metrics as well. So it's that access, equity, and exposure, right? Understanding. Okay. And meanwhile, I would like to see that uh, the recipital end, the parents, we want to see the more engaged uh, parents uh, with their um, students' um, education because it's important that our uh, literacy can uh, last for a long time. And not just the kids learning from a very young age, but also the involvement of the parents that we are looking for. Hopefully, we'll get a satisfaction um, score higher. For those parents who get more involved in their student education. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Yes. Before we get to these horse, get to the uh, proper assessments of things that we want to identify, we first must have the resources available. Facilities and an adequate number of highly trained professionals and teachers to provide them. Otherwise, we're not going to get to those things in the third and fourth year we just described. So, we don't have the teachers, we don't have the resources, facilities to help accommodate them. Even if we have an attitude to give an accessibility, we're not going to teachers provide the instruction, we have the facilities, and other resources. That to me is almost the first step. We need to tackle uh, the location, but then also the quality. We're not just trying to put people in a, 
in our space, we're trying to have the quality of space. Yeah, yeah it's easier. Okay. So, kind of piggybacking on, on that one is also just making sure that families have access to a variety of programs, families know what programs are available, and then that variety of programs is available throughout all of our counties, you know, whether you're dealing with a Montgomery, Prince George's County, or whether you're dealing with a Kent or Dorchester, um, that, that they all have that high quality uh, programs available. Piece again, um, and I don't know if I've heard this, but is there a piece of also um, that they even are aware of how important three year old, four year old programs are for their students? Absolutely. Okay. Other things we hope to see in pillar one as indicators of success. Okay, we're going to pillar two. Number two, high quality diverse teacher leaders. High quality diverse teacher leaders. The outcomes, approximate. Sorry, I got to move closer. Um, the delivery of Maryland students statewide in my district is sufficient to fill all needed positions, roles in schools and districts across the state, and provides professional learning opportunities to improve student outcomes additional responsibility, authority, status, and compensation uh, as they gain experience. What would success look like? If we could dream a little bit. If we were to hit this priority out of the park, what would change? What would we see happen? When children are looking at careers, their parents are saying, you should be a teacher because teaching is important and teaching matters, that we change the perception that those who can't do and those who can't teach, that that entire perception is changed and teachers are seen as the professionals that they are. And that when we talk about rigorous licensure, we're not just talking about a test, we're talking about uh, working in higher education to have rigorous training programs Founded and grounded in the science of teaching so that that professional element is there. People want their kids to be in classrooms, bringing up the next generation. Um, for me, success would be that our institutions of higher ed would be teaching all teachers the science of reading, not on the now, not the three QA system. But truly teaching teachers the foundational core of the science of reading, re, uh, reading using neuroscience, and then using implementation science strategies to teach students how to read. And until we get pre service training in line with the science and implementation plans, it's going to be really hard to get teachers to do what they want to do, which is to teach children how to read. Um, I would say um, increased rates of staff retention um, at schools across the state, um, a teaching workforce that better reflects the demographics of the state, and more closely aligns uh, with the demographics of the state, um, and an increase in the number of national board certified teachers across the state. Yeah, I, I would want to see, um, I, I would think we would see an impact on absenteeism and maybe there would be enhanced student engagement in their in their own education. So that would translate to um, differences in absenteeism um, and also concurrently um, better test scores and better career trajectories. More students. Other indicators, other things that you'd see happen if you were to hit this out of the park and do it real well. One of the things that um, I try to insert into the requirements for teaching licensure a few years ago was about male specific pedagogy. In other words, 
teachers are not being taught how to teach boys and have all colors. That's why there's so many discipline problems with our boys, because teachers don't know how to teach them, because boys learn differently than girls. <laughs> and a lot of our teachers, I know I wasn't trained on that. I never knew. It wasn't until finally I read a book, almost when I was retired as an administrator, school administrator, that I read a book and said, wait a minute, girls learn differently? You know, we talked about the multiple intelligences and kinesthetic learners and auditory learners and all those others, but they never taught us in our undergrad training or in all those seminars and professional development um, opportunities that we had that instruction needs to be different for our boys. And so when we have a workforce that's predominantly female, we're going to teach the way that we learn, about reading, about writing, about talking. But for our boys, especially in the elementary grades, they're not about sitting still listening to somebody talk for 30 minutes. They want to be active, and there's nothing wrong with them. They don't need to be medicated. They don't need to be labeled ADD, ADHD, DAD, or anything else. And they just need to be taught the way they learn. And a lot of teachers aren't trained in that. And it's only after they go through their own self-training, their own self-development, that they begin to say, wait a minute, I need to teach differently to relate not just to my girls who are doing marvelously in most cases, but I also need to change my instructional program to meet the needs of my boys. Anything else? What does what's the workforce look like? The, the uh, blueprint actually requires that the teacher preparation program have many of the elements that have been talked about, in particular, uh, the, the pedagogy strategy on, um, on cultural competence. And restorative practices have to be built into the uh, teacher preparation programs going forward. That's part of the blueprint. So um, I think one measure is that we want to look at how many of our teacher preparation programs have actually been certified as meeting the expectations of the blueprint. Okay. What about the workforce? What do you hope it looks like? We do this well. What's changed? My hope is that we see teachers staying in the classroom and that we see our best teachers staying in the classroom. And so the career ladder would incentivize that and help keep them in the classroom modeling for other teachers. <clears throat> We heard the teachers like the students in the classroom, of course, but then at the same time, most of our uh, teachers right now come from out of state. So whatever we're doing in our colleges and universities and that, it may not, these teachers may not have that training that we hope they have. So I want to see our teachers be people that came from universities in Maryland. And who will have this address, won't come for just five years and then go back to the other state and have a moment of service. We've got to change that. It's going to be a revolving door. So I heard both too the diversity of the teachers are matching the diversity of the classrooms and that your training here, your people here, maybe they were even more important. Wow. What about some of the teacher shortages we see right now? What is what changes with that with this work? Uh, again, in addressing teacher shortage, uh, we see that the profession is respected and recognized in the community um, as 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 profession. We see that children look at teachers and say, "I want to be." Or that person is me. Uh, that person. Um, we see teachers who can afford a home. We see teachers who are working multiple jobs. We see a school full of professional support personnel 
who are underpinning the work of the teachers and the learning of the students. We see teachers who collaborate regularly and enjoy professional collegiality in order to increase student achievement on a regular basis and have the resources to do it during the student day as professionals and their jobs get to do their work during their day. This is a follow up to my earlier comment, and in all due respect, Dr. Carolyn, it's not in there. I'm not talking about cultural training for the teachers. I'm talking about male specific pedagogy, how to teach boys of all colors. And I don't know if you've been former teachers in the room or current teachers in the room. I never took a course on how to teach boys or, or male art male instructional strategies, you know, that boys are wired for you. I was never taught that. Maybe some of the, you know, I, I, I went to my teacher training in the 70s. I, I've been in education close to 48 years. And I know I was never taught that. So perhaps it, it's changed, but that's what I'm talking about. Not just the culture, but male specific <laughs> pedagogy. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? The uh, teacher shortage in, in, in the more diverse teachers probably is one of our biggest challenges. And one that is probably most different to do. Keep in mind that the uh, blueprint, for the most part, was developed prior to the pandemic. We now have the impact that is added to the pressure and challenges of teaching. And at a time when we are looking for more teaching, more diverse teaching, the impact of the pandemic has reduced that number. Now, we could use that as, a, as an excuse to say to the public there are reasons why we can't get there anytime soon. Uh, I'm not sure we're going to have the luck of the public fully understanding. And the problem is that, that this is one of the areas that is most easily quantifiable, as you can see, and many. Some of the other things that we talk about in terms of how we effectively teach, uh, how we recruit, how we do some of the other things, uh, those things are a little bit more difficult, but they're easy to explain. Here, you have hard numbers and hard facts. And people, parents, and ministry can see them very clearly. So, at a time when the numbers are going down, the expectations are rising, and the people see the lack of progress, it creates a challenge. Uh, here's what I used to call the uh, snowflake problem. And the snowflake problem is this. Uh, it's not even there are a whole lot of things you have to do is you know, well over five billion dollars a Huge number of legislative issues. I could probably explain everything that we've done in a way for people to say, okay, we'll give a little more time. We're not sure the legislation will be as successful. We'll give a little more time. But a problem happens when it snows. When it snows, people don't give you the time because the snow hits immediately across all areas and they can measure it. It when it hits the ground, they know how long it takes to get up. This is our snowflake problem. They do not see more diverse teachers in the classroom. The teacher student ratio has not changed. And all the excuses that we give about why that happened, we will not have that luxury of people simply accepting. That's unfair, but it's a reality of what we do. Okay, last call for pillar two. You know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we need to look outside of the box, you know, to uh, fill the gap of um, teacher shortage. And I know pandemic is just a secondary factor to make this uh, teacher shortage even worse than before. 
and how do we handle that? I'm looking at other states that try to cut the student day, try to increase the class sizes. Are those the options we are looking for or we want to be? Probably not our best options. So again, I'm thinking outside the box, we make some uh, regulation, which I do believe the state board did uh, some uh, relaxation of the provision license of uh, teachers um, back in uh, a couple months back. But also we also need to look at some regulation to see anywhere that we can expand and build up the pool and our CCR, CPE programs. I think Ops um, brought and running very well at this point. And I can see, you know, um, the MSD is kind of promoting that for the year of 2025 or 2030. We have 45 percent of um, uh, the pool build up. So I would like to see that and uh, maybe expand it more to uh, outside of the boundary. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we will share these out with you too. All right, pillar two. We're going to move on to pillar three. Can you advance the slide? All right, pillar three are expected outcomes college and career readiness. An education system designed to ensure that all students who enter school ready to learn can reach their standard by 10th grade and no later than 12th grade and move on to move on to a choice of higher high quality post CCR program that prepare students for college, offer college credit in high school, and provide high quality CTE training or apprenticeship opportunities. So we're dreaming. Three to five years from now, what do we hope we see? <laughs> okay, three to five years from now, I hope to see um, CCR measurements in place that are standard and used all across Maryland the same way, in the same way that allow all students, and I'll say again, all students, the opportunity to demonstrate their college and career readiness for their ability to be able to enter a post-CCR So I'm a mom of two teenagers, one who recently graduated in the midst of COVID and one who is just starting high school this year. And I think one of the things that I want to see come out of this is that we create programs that students value that they understand why they're in school, that they want to be in school. Because if they want to be in school and they want to be in these programs and they see where they are headed, college, career, workforce, life, we solve some of the issues for things like attendance and wandering the hallways and just not caring about the classes that they're sitting in day to day. And so it's, it's that cycle of, providing a reason for kids to do well in school because they are motivated and they are enjoying some of the things that they are working on. To piggyback on what Ms. Morrow said, that we have a diverse enough pool of CCR pathways that every student can find their passion somewhere and take that passion to a successful career in life. But there has to be a really diverse pool so every kid finds their passion and it keeps them in school. Um, so I have several that I've written down. So one is an um, increased number of students meaning the CCR standard broken down by demographic without disparities according to demographic group. Um, Increased percentage of students completing an apprenticeship and or receiving an industry recognized credential. Um, increased number of students meeting the ninth grade on track measure. Um, increases in the six year graduation rate for college school Marylanders. And then job placement rate post high school at a livable wage. <laughs> Um, I would 
just like to say that as the grown ups in this room, as well as the local boards, the local superintendents, the local central offices, create the pathways for the students, not to forget the student voice in those pathways, because what uh, Mr. Crawford and I have seen as we travel around the state is the students can tell you exactly the barriers that need to be removed so that they can be successful. And they tweak it and they make it better. Other things that we, oh, <laughs> 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 I think another important thing to mention is that students will feel that the only thing to be successful is in new classes mm -hmm. and that we give access to dual enrollment and CTE and give each student a specific way that they can be successful in whatever career they want to. And the only thing that isn't just going to college or going to advanced classes, but doing their stuff at their own individualized simple support. Okay, last call. Oh, sorry. And I also want to see some um, uh, increase amount of uh, prep uh, courses um, that make this information available, not just starting from the uh, middle school, because even push it down to elementary school to give our students at a younger age something to look for. And uh, hopefully, we'll attract a more and uh, more students to be interested in. And also, the uh, community engagement. Yeah, we have many uh, partners already set up. And that volume, I can see it got a uh, client of uh, maybe three, two, three uh, uh, goals than the year before, which is very nice. Uh, I would like to see the uh, number of partnerships with the community even uh, expands more and, and more collaborations and programs. Thank you. I should have given you a region. Like you read it, you do it, then you read it. Back to the career and not just the college end. I remember um, when I was in school and, and subsequent to that, it was almost a down that, that people were not going to go to college. Um, my two nephews ended up getting higher paid jobs out of the tech and my college educated students got the We need to, to focus that not everybody has the same uh, way to get ahead and to use the future skills and school questions and whatever that is. Yeah. Yes. Well, making sure that one of these pathways is a teaching pathway so we are growing our teachers in our schools. <laughs> and, and I was just working in the state, start early, right? Start early when we're still in love with it. That's, yes. All right. All right. One. Oh, I just need to add one little comment saying, how about the happiness index? Okay, yeah, life, work, a balance. I think that's um, it matters and make it more important to many, many people, even if you have a central career goal at a very uh, early age. Yeah, how can you continue to stick with the one profession uh, for so many years? Because if you're happy in that profession to make it keep going and waking up every morning and say, yes, I want to be a teacher. I want to teach my students. I want to be with them, especially with the pandemic area. Then we hear many uh, teachers say, I wish I could touch my students and give them heart. So I think that's important and also uh, that makes their uh, happy index higher. Thank you. Okay, we're going to shift to pillar four. So pillar four, more, resource, more resources for students to be successful. The expected outcome, students who are from low-income households attend schools with high concentrations of students who are from low, high, yeah, low-income families are English, English learners and require special education services to receive the additional resources and services they need to achieve success in school and overall health and well-being 
and by fiscal year 2032, meet the College of Career Readiness CCR standards at the same rate as other students. All students who need behavioral health services can access them. That's the target we're shooting for. So what do we want to see? What would we expect or hope to see happen in the next three to five years? So I'll, I'll kick it off talking about community schools. Um, really just making sure that we are bringing our community and our parents and our families and our community partners together um, in our school systems, in our school buildings to get students the, the basic services that they need. We have students who you know have health care and food every day and happy families are going to be able to focus on education when they're at school. So helping to make sure that that network is strong um, and, and our school buildings are able to bring all those pieces together. Well, this is one that is not totally within the hand of the state board of AIB and education itself. Um, we have to realize that the we don't operate here in an isolated fact. The many things in terms of the resources that are needed are outside of our domain. Yet we need to work probably with uh, those in other areas for housing, uh, health, uh, in other areas that will allow us to uh, utilize the resources that we have in addition to direct them more appropriately to prioritize. But uh, we can't fall into the trap of believing that our educational system in and of itself, no matter how well we do, no matter how well we do the resources, that we are in it by ourselves and we have to deal with it alone. Otherwise, uh, we are going to climb a mountain that we can never uh, get to the top of. This is one of those, I think, one of the most important pillars of the blueprint. And I really wanted to dig a little deeper on some comments that you all made earlier today. You know, this is talking about the low-income students. It's talking about students in poverty, students who struggle, students who don't have the greatest opportunity and how you focus and help develop that. And I'm just wondering, you know, uh, poverty level is probably pretty significant in public schools in the state, and uh, resources really need to go in these parts of the uh, of the state to be able to do this. I really want to tug on some earlier comments uh, uh, you all have made about this issue and about how you would see this play out. So we talk about uh, young black men uh, and how they are resourced. We talk about underperforming schools and how they're resourced. But it's a challenge, right? Because you want to see progress and you want to make investments where you see progress. How do you, how would you judge progress in these areas so that you would then say let's let's resource them how would you know they will need them what would you hear what would you see Clarence. one of the things that again is we're stewards of the taxpayer dollars. We're asking the taxpayers of the state of Maryland at the state level and at the local levels to invest even more money in the education. I think we need to pay very close attention to the underperforming schools 
and really began to look at them because I think what you'll see is that the underperforming schools have largely been underperforming for decades. At the same time, you see other schools that look very much like the underperforming schools perform well. And I just think we can't give a pass to the underperforming school. We may have to take, and I know this is very controversial, but we may have to take a, a more directed role working with the LEAs to begin to address these issues. Otherwise, what we will do is we'll pump more dollars in, but at the end of the day, we won't see anything different in outcomes. So I think part of that is a, a responsibility for us to help make the case and to be able to show a way forward. But we cannot allow these underperforming schools that have been underperforming for decades to just continue to exist and just absorb more money. Because in some cases, clearly more money happens. But in some cases, it's not money. It's leadership. It's commitment. And we've got to figure out how to bring those things to bear. <coughs> maybe part of what we could be doing in the is, is to do more work looking at how other states and other school systems are dealing with <coughs> underperforming schools. And maybe we have to bring some of these lessons back, some of it we might be able to do. Currently, some of it may require additional legislation down the road. But we cannot have a truly transformed educational system if we continue to allow the underperforming schools to do what they've been doing. Because I think that's what's the most likely outcome for the underperforming schools. They'll just go on and nothing materially will happen. Expectations, right? Absolutely. Expectations. Yeah. Yeah. So I think one of the things, how, how we will know, especially in, in, in underperforming schools and low-income areas, I think having to do less involved with the judicial system, um, because then these children would be engaged, they would be on a career path, and they would see a, a way to a life that would give them the kinds of things that, that they would need and that they could build a family on. How will we know? I think we could use data better. I mean, if we if we have a lot of data at our, you know, in sitting in silos, think about ways to pull that data together better to inform um, progress along all of the pillars. And not only data within MSDE, but other metrics outside. You know, we have one of the best health information health information exchanges in the country. And we have other data that are readily avail available from the juvenile justice system and, and so forth. And we could be thinking through how to, you know, use data to hone the strategy and implementation and going forward. Over here. Yeah, thank you. I will add to Dr. Roca about the um the data. Yeah, the number, yeah, the uh, number can say a lot of words. Uh, let me just give you the pictures and what you took with those numbers. And as earlier on, I think um Superman and Chandra say uh Marin is good at tracking. Yeah, so we got data there. <laughs> Not just uh inside the um the MSD, but also outside that we need to look. And the other thing I want to give comment is that to uh, see the success of this pillar, that we often time are so eager to fix what was not right or improve it, improve it, and identify those area or flip the coin. We look at the other side. What are the goodness out of this uh, group? Even it is a uh, performing school. There got to be something good out of. Uh, the entire uh, student body or whatever that we are looking for. And we build up their strength and uh, without the witness. 
um, and group, I think, for um, um, child development. Yeah, we also need to look at the positive side where we try to um, guide the um, areas that we can improve to the right direction. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? What are we looking for? So here's your, oh, yes. I think if we do it right, then we've moved away from the idea that resources means money. Because resources are also human beings in the building, which you have to pay, which takes money, then we everything takes money. But 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 when we look at the resources that a school has, we're looking at the human resources, we're looking at the instructional resources, are they science-based? You know, are they proven? We're looking at what successful schools are doing, and we're taking that to scale and using those things in other buildings. We are looking at the community school model. That doesn't mean that the school has everything for families. That means the school is connected to the community resources that help the families. And we're not putting everything on the school. We're combining together as communities to bring what children need. It's people, it's money, it's time. It's a lot of different things that come to bear. So we will walk into a successful school and we will see caring, well-trained people working with children, keeping their best interests at heart. We'll see children come to school regularly because school is a safe place to be. They have the resources that their families need. Families will be in schools on a regular basis because the community has brought the resources to the school. It becomes a hub. It doesn't solve all problems, but it becomes a hub where all the community comes together to make sure the whole community is successful. Um, we're here for a while, so don't worry. So back to that's what it looks like, and ultimately, what that leads to is students being able to read and do math and write. And so, ultimately, what are we looking for? Children who are literate, children who are uh, literate with no, with numeracy, um, and and so all of these things contribute. But ultimately, anything we do has to be laser focused on how do we get there. Um, and I think parsing it out, what is, what's the, what is the most important thing? Teacher training, parent education, um, support within the buildings, looking at schools differently. We're still in a 1950 model of how we do school. So what's a different way to do it? Because everybody's different, but we're still in the 1950s. So just a, a few more. Anybody else? I want to take off. All right, so here's what we did. We just provided a basis, a framework that is going to then be taken by these work groups to flush out more, to bring in baseline data, to explore this and determine, and then have public comment as well to figure out what are these indicators of success on this pathway to achieving these outcomes. So that's the next step that's going to come, and that will circle back, and, and um, definitely people from MSDE will be involved, and other organizations as they as they flush this out, and they're going to take the work you just did as kind of a base for that, all right? So as the work groups are looking, we should also make sure we have leading indicators. So just as uh, Dr. I think Dr. Getty said, we're looking at being able to read by the third grade. And is the children entering kindergarten ready to read? It is. Are the teachers in one through K, and they've been trained in the science of reading? Are they using? Proven resource, a uh, research-based methodology to <clears throat> teach it. So, so that we're not surprised because if we just rely on the lagging indicator, it's just going to tell us in three years where we are. But if we integrate some leading indicators, it'll give us an earlier indication of whether we're on track or off track. The second thing I just think that we need to think about is how do we 
set metric when all of our school systems are at different points. If you look at some school systems are doing pretty well at children being able to do that grade or work pretty well in terms of apprenticeships, others are not. So how do we do that? Do we, I don't have an answer. Do we look at rates of increase? I, I just don't know how we account for the variation, keeping everybody on track and having everybody pulling in the same direction when their baselines are different. So we just need to keep that in mind as we go forward as well. I just don't have an answer. Mm -hmm. Again. Uh, in line with that, you know, we we really need to we get a lot of data system wide, camera wide, system wide, but we really need to get down actually to the school level to see how the various schools should what schools are making progress, <coughs> whether or not I guess it's in one of the high schools in my town that one might be different too, but. They had had some problems, and the superintendent, or the uh, principal at that school, had a real connection with his students to the point where when one of the young boys didn't come to school one day, and his mother was upset, I happened to be there that day, he left our group and went to talk to the young man about how important he was to the school. So it's, it's the people we're trying to fix. And we need to do that with people are so different. We have to be able to adapt to the workers. So we started this day talking about our visions, right? Very similar. You all just have outlined for us some things that are going to show us the pathway to that vision. How do we know we're successful? We also started the day talking about partnership. Partnership between these two boards partnership as we take on this new challenge. And so we're going to end the day with our chairs kind of talking to us a little bit about what is this partnership going to look like? How are we going to function together as we move forward? First of all, let me thank the uh, facilitators for doing a wonderful job today on a very difficult time. I will also acknowledge and uh, thank uh, Clarence and uh, all of those in the state of New York. Um, I mean, I'm going to pick up what Clarence said earlier about the grit. Uh, we all in good years and good years. I've watched it in the and put a lot of hard time and soldiers in the Something we did not have to do and continue to work on that. So, thank you again for your great leadership. And also to our two trusted on the ground people who are making these things happen one way or the other. Uh, that is Rachel and our superintendent. Thank you for very much. And I really appreciate your help and support, superintendent, on uh, getting us through some very difficult challenges. Uh, it's not always been easy, but uh, uh, you and your staff have worked with us for very long time. And all of you for being here today. This has been some of a long session. Uh, despite some of the challenges that we heard this morning, uh, I am very, very optimistic. And I agree with what Clarence said earlier. We have a wonderful opportunity for us. We have a plan. Again, it's just a plan. We have resources. We have leadership throughout the state. And I think that we have a shared commitment to fulfilling the objectives that have been outlined. Uh, that's a very good position to start from. I use the word start from because this is just the start of a long process. It's not just 10 years, but we'll hopefully set the groundwork for our system to move throughout the country for many, many years to come. Uh, let's not make mistakes here today on what we heard and where we stand today. Uh, Rachel outlined five pillars. But we make, we make a mistake every once in a while 
But look at these tools in the video. Uh, they were crafted to be integrated in a fashion to be used comprehensively and not piecemeal. They all relate to some part of it. So part of our task is to keep the entire framework in front of us, all of the things. You may have a particular interest you want to ask about one item or the other. But the challenge here is to look at all of them comprehensively. Um, the challenge also to us is to not to uh, build on realistic expectations. Uh, the state did not get into the challenges and problems we see today overnight. And we're not going to resolve it. And so we have to be committed for the long haul. Uh, committed to make sure that we do everything that's possible to get to that end. Uh, and I've heard too many people say, well, we now have a blueprint. We now have money. And therefore, our problem is that it's simply just to do what we want. It will take time, it will take effort, it will take us working together to get these things done. That's why this partnership is important. Uh, we also need to keep in mind that we're in a changing political landscape. You are a member of the General Assembly, that's the governor. We have an opportunity, but we also have the need to explain to people what we're about. And if we, in some way, channel challenges all the time without looking at both solutions and opportunities, then we're going to send the wrong message out. The message should be that everything that we talk about not in tonight. And I look at this, and this is a good place to be in, a good position to start. And we need to think about the positive aspect of what we have before us. And I think if we use that as a framework to go forward, uh, I believe that we're going to be very successful. That's my optimistic view. I may not reflect that all the time. I may have questions about different things. But overall, when I look at where we are today, uh, I am reasonably confident that we can get there. Uh, with everybody with right? I agree with Ike and I just want to just thank everyone, uh, representatives from both boards, our facilitators, even the members of the public that have come. I think we're at a great point. I too am very optimistic about where we are. I think that as we go forward, Part of our challenge is to engage Maryland because despite the best efforts of the people represented here, this is a Maryland issue. We have 24 school systems with elected officials at those levels, 24 superintendents, and part of our challenge is to engage them, and we've already started to do that, continue to engage them so that they too catch the vision and feel some ownership for delivery. I think it is doable. I think it is within our reach. And um, again, I'm just extremely excited about the start. This kind of communication needs to continue. And I think part of what I, I was in the meeting earlier this week, and one person said they were talking about a big challenge of trying to bring everyone together. And, and one person stood up and just said, you know, these are people. So we move at the rate of trust. We will advance our agenda at the rate of trust. So this is a private sector group talking about the private sector issue, but it comes down to again. The communications, the working together, the trust. And when we work together, we begin to trust each other. And as we begin to trust each other, we can begin to continue to advance this. Uh, I got a suggestion from um, Ms. Morrow. She suggested before we get away from here that we take a group picture. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was just asking someone to do that very thing. Okay, very good. Good, good. So 
one of the things before we go is maybe we could clear some of that space out there and we can take a group picture for posterity. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> okay, so a couple of things, rules of facilitators is when you get a group out early, you get bonus points. We're getting out a little early. So that's the good news. Um, last thing is, I think you probably need a motion to adjourn. Yes. I'd like to, um, the board now open for a motion to adjourn. We'll move. We have uh, uh, McCusker seconded by uh, Dr. Kerwin. Seeing no further discussion, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Commissioner. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Here you go, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You did a good job figuring that out. <laughs> yeah, it's never easy. No.